Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there into a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, and he cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place. The hour is now late. You should send these people into the towns and villages so they can buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You will give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven. He gave thanks to God, and he blessed them and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples then gave them to the crowds. All ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men and women and children as well. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now, if you snuck in a little bit late this morning and didn't get a colored slip of paper, would you raise your hand? Everybody's got to have a colored slip of paper. Okay. Um, Phoebe, do you have the basket with the papers? I think Nancy and Holly both need one. Okay. Great. So, this is one of my favorite days of the church year. It's World Communion Sunday, and I've luckily had a chance to preach on this twice here in your community, in our community, and this is the third go-round. So, I thought we'd do things a little bit different this week. And this month of October is also when our Mission and Outreach Committee is taking the donation collection for Neighbors in Need, which, as Sue mentioned, is a project of the United Church of Christ. Um, churches all around the country take this collection in October, and the funds go to give grants to organizations that help to meet the needs of their local communities. And this year, as Sue mentioned, the focus is on hunger and specifically on the hunger of children. And we know that hunger is a pervasive problem. But so many of us are blessed to the point where we don't really know what hunger looks and feels like on a daily basis, not to the scale that most people around the world experience it. That's why I wanted us to focus today on world hunger. As we break the bread of communion and we're reminded that Christ feeds our every need, on this World Communion Sunday, it's, not, it's only right that we take some time to think about the more than 2.2 million people who live in poverty, of the near, I'm sorry, 2.2 billion people, 2.2 billion people who live in poverty and the nearly 795 million people who suffer from chronic hunger. 795 million people. And did you know that a child dies from malnutrition or related preventable, preventable illness every 10 seconds? Every 10 seconds. So in the three minutes I've been talking to you, that's... 18 children. And that's more than 8,000 children a day. You may think that hunger is about too many people and too little food, but that's not the case. Our rich and bountiful planet produces enough food to feed every woman, man, and child on earth. Hunger is about power. Its roots lie in inequalities about access to resources, and the results are illiteracy, poverty, war, and the inability of families to grow their own food. This has been the case from the beginning of time. Our first scripture lesson this morning, which I haven't read, which I'll read now, 
was from, is from the book of Deuteronomy. It's Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 19. And Deuteronomy is basically a book of the holy rules for the people, people of Israel. It's the same book that includes the Ten Commandments. And Deuteronomy 24, 19 says, When you reap your harvest in your field, forget a sheaf of wheat in the field. Do not go back for it. It shall be left there for the stranger, for the orphan, for the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all your undertakings. Right there, book of Deuteronomy, right at the start of the Bible, the people are instructed to leave a little remnant for those who don't have their own fields, who can't grow their own food, and who live basically on the charity of others or on whatever they can find. But the situation is far from hopeless. That's good. We have made progress. Efforts from organizations like the UCC, like Oxfam, and like many others have helped to decrease the population, the proportion of the population living in hunger. But hundreds of millions still don't have access to the food that they need. And food prices are volatile. For many, food that's within reach one day is out of reach the next. The one thing I want you to remember is that everyone on earth has the same basic needs. It's only our circumstances, where we live and the culture that we're born into that differ. Some of us are born into relative prosperity and security, while millions, through no choice of their own, are born into poverty. As each of us walked in the door here today, I asked you to take a strip of paper and we drew our lots at random. And we'll talk about those in a second. If you have a blue strip of paper, you are representing the high income group. Your dinner tonight will be roast chicken and vegetables and bread, and you may even get dessert. It's pretty good. You represent 20% of the world's population with the highest per person income. To be a member of this highest group, this most fortunate group, you need to earn a minimum income of just $7,750 a year. But some of you earn much, much more, and most of you are lucky enough to be able to afford a nutritious diet on a daily basis. In fact, some of you are able to exceed your daily a calorie allotment and then face health problems as a result, like diabetes. But the good news is you also have access to good health care. It's a given that your children will attend school, and the only uncertainty is how many years after high school they will continue to study. You and your family probably live in a comfortable and secure home, and you own at least one car and two televisions. When you plan for an annual vacation, you don't worry that your job will disappear while you're gone. You have access to virtually everything you need and the security to enjoy it. Now, if you have a pink paper, you're in the middle income group, and your dinner tonight will be rice and beans. Not glamorous, but it'll sustain you. And you represent roughly 30% of the world's population you earn between $2,000 and $7,750 a year. The levels of access and security that you enjoy vary greatly. You live on the edge. For many, it would take only losing a job or a serious illness to throw you into poverty. You probably own no land and may work as a day laborer for someone else. You, you may have some use of electricity, but not much and your children only have a few years of schooling, and usually that's just the boys. Alternatively, you may have left your family to work in a city, and you hope that the money you earn at a less than minimum wage job as a sweatshop worker will eventually allow you to move back home and make a better life for your family. Now, if you have an orange paper, you're in the low income group and your dinner tonight will be half a cup of rice and some water. 
you represent the majority of the world's population, just over 50%. 50%. Your income is less than $2,000 a year, under $5.50 a day. Although many of you earn much, much less. And every day is a struggle to meet your family's basic needs. Finding food, water, and shelter can consume your entire day. For many women, you, it would not be uncommon to have to walk five to ten miles just to get water. And you spend hours working in the fields. When food is scarce, you often eat less so that your family members will have enough. Many of you, both men and women, are frequently hungry. Some of you are homeless or living in structures so flimsy that a hard rain or heavy wind will take it down. Even though education is the single most important factor in preventing poverty, school is a luxury that few of you can allow your children to attend, for the children will have to work as well. And adequate health care is out of the question. If you're lucky enough to work, you probably are a tenant farmer and must give your landowner 75% of what you reap. So take a moment to look around you. 80% of you will go to sleep tonight hungry. 80% of you will not share in the bounty of our planet. Now ask yourself, what can we do to make a difference? In our scripture lesson from this morning, Jesus has just learned of the death of John the Baptist, his close friend who was a leader in the community, who taught people to return to the way of God. And when Jesus learned of the death of his friend, he went out in a boat to be alone by himself. But of course, the community also learned of John the Baptist's death, and when they heard this, they needed answers. They needed to talk about it. And so they came to find Jesus, and the crowd gathered, and he had compassion on them. He went out, and it says he healed their sick. That may mean that he laid hands on those who were ill, but it may also mean that he gave them words of assurance, words of comfort, comfort in a difficult time. He showed them compassion. But then the logistical issue came up. All these people, not enough food. What are we going to do? And the disciples suggest that they do what, what normally happens. You go to the store and you get some food. But Jesus says, they don't need to go away. You will give them something to eat. And they replied, well, all we have are these five loaves and two fish. That won't be enough. So he asked for them to bring the food to him, and he blessed it. He blessed it, and in doing so, offered it up to God. And when he gave it out to the disciples, and they gave it to the people, you know what happened. It multiplied. Now, in my opinion, I don't think it just multiplied. I don't think it just divided and grew and grew. I think it multiplied because people realized that if we can look beyond our fear that we won't have enough, and if we can share a little bit, and everyone shares a little bit, the food begins to multiply. This is the miracle of feeding the multitude. Not that the people were fed, though that's important. It's that Jesus helped the disciples and everyone there to see that they could look beyond themselves and give what little they had. And as a result, everyone had enough, and even more than enough, bountiful blessings. Now, wouldn't it be great if someone like Jesus could come along and bless every loaf of bread and every fish so that it would just multiply and there would be no problem with world hunger? But we know that the real miracle that Jesus shows us is that as long as we're focused on making yourself sure that you are fed and everyone else can take a back seat, well then, there will be hunger in the world. But we're brave, when we're brave enough to share what little we have with others, that's when the blessings multiply. I hope that this exercise has helped to deepen your awareness of world hunger and poverty. 
The test now is how we put this knowledge to use. If what you've learned and experienced today has stirred something in you, there are things that you can do, ways to take action. You can contribute to the Neighbors in Need collection. There are also some uh, forms on the table in the Gressinger Room from Bread for the World, which is an organization that helps to advocate for legislation policy that works on issues of hunger. Nelson Mandela once said, in this new century, millions of people remain imprisoned, enslaved, and in chains, trapped by the prison of poverty. It's time to set them free. Like slavery and apartheid, poverty is not nat natural. It's man-made and can be overcome. Overcoming poverty is not a gesture of charity. It's an act of justice. It is the protection of a fundamental human right, the right to dignity and a decent life. Sometimes it falls upon a particular generation to be great, and we can be that great generation. Let's let our greatness blossom. Of course, the task is not easy, but not to do this would be a crime against humanity, against which we ask all humanity to now rise up. Each of us, in our own way, have blessings beyond our recognition. Each of us, in our own way, have ways that we can share a bit of what we have to ensure that others don't go hungry. As we join together in World Communion this morning, I'd invite you to think about the ways in which Christ feeds your hunger and calls you to work to feed the hunger of all those around the world. Amen. Now let us join together in singing our communion hymn number 321, Break Thou the Bread of Life. <laughs> 